My grandmother died of breast cancer. My maternal auntie had breast cancer at 50. And so I'm kind of like, it's inevitable. I just didn't expect to get it at 40. And I really feel like that breast cancer diagnosis was my kupuna's way of saying, slap, 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 wake up, Diane. When you're at work, your mind is at home. When you're at home, your mind is at work. Hula is the tool that I use to connect to my ancestors. It keeps our ancestors relevant in our minds. Their knowledge and their insight of the way they view the world is written in these mele and hula that we get to, in a way, decode. I'm always talking about pilina, pilina connection. We have to have these connections with other people. It's what I think makes humans thrive. It was in the hospital bed when the CNA came by. Her name was Ina. She was just so loving. And now mind you, CNAs in the hospital and in caregiving situations are probably the lowest paid. But the way she made me feel just by washing my hair was so caring and loving that I was like, I gotta remember this because this is what I want to impart on other people in my job in healthcare. And that meant so much to me. Everyone was just phenomenal. She just made me feel like a queen at that moment. And that was like, okay, I'm on the comeback trail. I have to get better because this is how I want others to feel in their darkest despair days. Greater Good Radio, connect, learn, heal, and grow is brought to you by Brain Gain Hawaii, a boutique executive recruiting, career development, and coaching firm. Learn more at BrainGainHI.com. Today's guest is Dr. Diane Paloma. Dr. Diane Paloma is the President and Chief Executive Officer for Hawaii Dental Service, which offers Hawaii families affordable dental plans to maintain healthy smiles and total body health. Previously, she served as the Chief Executive Officer for the King Lunalilo Trust and Home, and is also former Director of the Queen's Health System's Native Hawaiian Health Program. Prior to Queen's, she spent time at the John A. Burns School of Medicine as a faculty member, worked for HMSA and its subsidiaries, and started her career working for a private physician. A Kamehameha Schools graduate, she earned her BS in Psychological Science from UCLA, MBA, and the University of Hawaii, and a PhD in Healthcare Administration from Capella University, Imua. Dr. Paloma has spent her career in the health field since 1995 and was able to combine her passion for Native Hawaiian culture with the health and medical fields. A lifelong learner, she is a proud graduate and former faculty member of the UH system. She spent some time growing up on the Manoa campus, Keller Hall, as her mother was a 30-year UH employee. Diane volunteers her time as a board member with various community organizations advancing health and education. In 2002, she completed the Uniki process for the status of Olapa with Kapahula o Kamehameha. She currently serves as Alaka'i, which is the Halau leader, for Kapahula o Kalelehua. Dr. Paloma is also a Pacific Century Fellow and Omidyar Fellow, serves on the Board of Regents for the University of Hawaii, and was inducted into the University of Hawaii Shider College of Business's Annual Hall of Honor recipients in 2023. Welcome to Greater Good Mahalo. Radio, Dr. Diane Paloma. So your mom worked at Keller Hall. My mom yes. worked at Keller Hall her whole career. Pretty much the my whole mom time the whole time, too. On mainframes. My mom worked on like the management stuff towards the end. My mom is the one who taught me how to use email. So when I went away to college, she's like, Diane, go to this computing center, wherever it was. I can't remember the name of the building. Sign up for an account. So this is like email where they assigned you a code. And I remember my code. it was Izzy GI5 at UCLA.edu. She walked me through it because there was no cell phones back then. I could call home once a week if I had a calling card. And then I would go, I would write a message. I'd be like, Hi, mom. Send. And then you'd go about your day. The next day you'd come back. And then there was a message waiting for me from my mom. And that was like the most profound thing. We're like, I'm talking to my mom on a computer. What is that? Right. But you had to go to computer lab because there was no laptops. There was no That's when we were internet. excited to get emails. It was mosaic. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. Too many oh, my emails. gosh. My mom is actually talking to me. I don't have to call her, right? There, I mean, there's no FaceTime. There's no texting. This is like not, this is before the world of pagers too, so. Long distance calls were expensive back then. Yeah. Because we're about the same age. And Remember? it was like dollar something, $2 a minute, whatever. Yeah. It was expensive. And you and bought a card I could only money. call home 
yeah. once a week and then the phone will get passed around hi grandma how you doing i'm good okay yeah classes are good okay next here's auntie here's uncle here's mom here's dad here's grandpa and it would be like saying hi to everybody in 20 minutes and then, okay okay bye my calling card is running out bye click <laughs> we're old school <laughs> yeah that stuff was expensive and i was just talking about this to someone i don't know how I ever paid like the two hundred, three hundred dollar phone bills that we had. I'm I don't like, know how I never pay them. How did we even like transfer money? <laughs> I don't know. I'm pretty sure I probably charged. My, I'm pretty sure I didn't have a debit aunt. card. Yeah, we probably wrote checks. I remember we were writing checks, but yeah. I yeah, life seems so simple back then. But then at the same time, when I think of all the things you can do now, like I can Venmo my daughter, I can Zell her, or there's like. 10 different platforms that I could send her money. She's in college, but I'm like, it's almost too easy. <laughs> Since we're talking about kind of back then, what's some context that will help us to understand who Dr. Diane Paloma is now? Like context mm-hmm. that from your childhood. I'd say I grew up like regular middle class. I went to Kamehameha from kindergarten, which back then, 1978, when you enter kindergarten, it wasn't as huge of a deal as it is today. It was kind of all I knew. I'll say my dad was the staunch, like, you will get an education. And he would always explain to me and my siblings, like, I can't give you a, a big house. I can't give you an endowment. I can't buy you, like, super nice things like jewelry. But I can give you an education. And if I give you that, nobody can take it away from you. And then you can do whatever you want with it, right? So my dad was pure Japanese, very, very strict. I won't say like samurai dad, but we all ate dinner together no matter what. No matter what was going on, you must be at the dinner table. Even if you weren't hungry, you'd still have to sit there. And my mom was Hawaiian Chinese. Are you the only child? No, no, no. So I have a younger sister and a younger brother. So it was me and my sister for the longest time. My brother came along when I was 12 and my sister was 10 and so I was I think I was like in seventh grade and my mom's like hey we're gonna have another baby and we're like wait how you know like you you know you've gone through sex ed by then and I was just like wait you and dad what we're gonna have another baby so my, my brother was born though it was awesome because baby we was love one kids. surprise or surprise talk baby about that. Oh. surprise baby mm. and but it was the best because I love babies i remember waking up, I would help my mom. So even though I was like in seventh or eighth grade, I woke up a couple times to help feed my brother in the middle of the night because I knew my mom was going back to work. So me and my brother have more of a, I think I'm like the second parent. If he couldn't get something from my parents, he would come to me and ask me. He was also the best birth control ever because when you're 17 and you want to go to Kahala Mall with your friends and you want to take the car, my mom would be like, Sure, you can go to Kahala Mall as long as you take your brother. So I'd be walking around with my friends and a five-year-old kid at Kahala Mall. I'm sure people were looking at me like, Diane had a kid? Like, what's going on, right? So for me growing up, family was one of the most important things. And I think that actually helped start a lot of ritual and regularity. My dad's mom is one of eight children and Thanksgivings would be with the Japanese side of the family and the eight siblings would take turns hosting. So Thanksgiving would be like so big 70 people in a tiny little two-bedroom house in Wahiwa. And then on my mom's side, my grandfather is one of 14. And so we would try and get together. Half of them moved to the mainland. The other half were here. And so we, like parties were just abundant. And I just remember like, always having lots of cousins, always having lots of family around and knowing, you know, like the aunties, my Chinese aunties would be like, oh, Diane, you're so round, you're so fat. So, you know, like, oh, you're gaining weight, right? But that, but yeah, it took me a while to learn. That is an interior. That's a Chinese side, right? Yeah, that means I love you. That means I love you. It took a long time for me to realize that as a young kid. You're like, I don't want to go to that auntie's house. She always makes me feel fat. And yet they're feeding me all kind of sum. And then at the end, they'd give you money. And you're like, oh, okay, that wasn't so bad. I think I could stick it out. That means they love you. <laughs> you're so you have round. To translate. Your nose is so fat. <laughs> my grandma, my popo, right, would tell me, what's wrong with your face? 
you fat. <laughs> you're something's wrong with your face. Like so much pimples. <laughs> and I would tell her, Merry Christmas, Popo. <laughs> you know, what the heck? But it was at that grandparents' house. They knew I loved lomi salmon. So they would always have lomi salmon, lop chong, and rice. Mm -hmm. Like that was my staple Chinese side of the family. Like, oh, Diane, mom, you know, my mom is bringing the kids over. Okay, we got to get lomi salmon, rice, and lop chong. I don't know why. why I just ate lop chong last night. That, that's yeah. probably why. We get round, right? The lop chong. So Man. fatty, so good, though. <laughs> It's funny, yeah, like uh, older Chinese ladies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the older Chinese ladies are going to be the first ones to kick someone's butt. Yeah. If they mess with you. All they have to do is look at you. <laughs> and then you're like, oh, okay, I'm out of line. Yeah. Check yourself. Yeah. <laughs> That's why it's so funny. I was at the uh, SHRM conference like a few years ago and they had the mainland speaker come down. And the mainland speaker put on the screen this image of kind of like an Indian looking lady or so on. But it was like an older woman and then kind of a younger woman at the stove. So one's kind of at the stove like mm -hmm. this and the other one's behind. And the guy says, okay, the mom looks over and says, son, who cooks better, me or your wife? What would you say in this? And I think, I don't know what the point was. He's trying to like, how do you deal with these kind of conversations? <laughs> right? So then, he, you know, his answer was, is like, you tell her, mom, are you trying to cause trouble? You do not say this. And he's going this whole thing. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> brother hasn't been to anywhere here. No. Because you'd have had the slipper on the head about two seconds after you even looked at, you know what I mean? Like, oh my <laughs> God, I would love to see that happen. Like, if I were the wife behind, I'd be like, yes, acknowledge mom. Because yeah. I know that someday I'm going to be in the front and daughter-in-law or whomever is going to be behind me right, right you want to get some cracks mm -hmm. try that move that is like yeah. that was, oh, i would love to have seen that like dude <laughs> can you please come and show me that that yeah. is so amazing and then take like five steps back with my phone yeah and record this so, oh, I'll get some good on so, here yeah so i say like family was what i remember the most i mean we didn't have much like the biggest thing we did was like neighbor island trips with my grandparents maybe like every other year mm -hmm. Like, and then we would rotate. We'd do Maui, Big Island, Kauai. Oh, you went every year? Like every other year. Oh. Every other year. Mm -hmm. And like, I do remember one year, and I don't know how they swung it, because they were both two state workers. They took us to Disneyland. I remember my first time to Disneyland was fifth grade, and it was awesome, right? It was like unbelievable. I didn't know that there could be life like that outside of Hawaii, right? And I'm sure they instilled me at some point on that trip, like, Okay, think of like there are many colleges here. So I, and I don't know if I ever like thought at that moment like okay, LA is where I want to go, but I can't remember a time that I didn't think I wanted to go to UCLA. And so that was kind of like the goal. And I also danced ballet at the time. I didn't really dance hula until eighth grade, but and at some point in elementary school, I wanted to be a core dancer at the San Francisco Ballet. So they were able to take us to the theater and show us all these other things. And it was at the NBC Concert Hall. I remember watching the San Francisco Ballet, and I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to dance ballet like that. I was doing toe shoes. And I say I partially grew up here in Manoa because the ballet school I went to was at this Japanese school. Right? Oh, that's Raylene um, Kimura's mom. Raylene, Ki oh. Raylene Kimura's. That's Miss Kimura, right? Mrs. Kimura. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? That's my classmate's mom. That's her mom? That's yeah. who I danced ballet for? Yeah, yeah. yeah. All those I think years? So. Right across the street I think that's her mom. from. It was old Toyos. Yeah, yeah. So I was like all into dance, all into ballet. And then I was academic, smart enough to be able to get good grades. And then I remember my dad thinking like, oh, okay, right, the, your typical Asian parent you should be a doctor or a lawyer because those are the only two professions that, you know, you probably are good for. Never mind anything else, right? It was just doctor or lawyer. So I was like, okay, I'll be a doctor. Right. I love kids. I can be a pediatrician. So I right, most of my academic years at Kamehameha were dancing hula, dancing ballet and then school. Mm -hmm. And it was super fun. I also because of dance, I got to travel. So like at 16, I was dancing hula in Japan, we went to Alaska to receive the logs for the Hawaii Loa canoe. I went to New Zealand it was just like... So all of those was for hula? For hula. And the halal was at Kamehameha? Or Kamehameha. That? It was like the students, uh -huh. right? It was with Concert Glee. And it was kind of like this eye-opening moment. Like, 
there's life outside of Hawaii, right? I still think to this day when people cannot get out of Hawaii, it, it changes the way you view the world and how you view your hometown, right? Those experiences, I think, led me to right, think a little bit more outside of Hawaii. And also, I do want to bring up, right, because we talk about the brain drain and how, yes, I believe that experiences have to be held outside of Hawaii for you to really appreciate Hawaii. Like going away to school was the one thing probably that made me come back home. But I realized not a lot of kids do that. They leave and they don't come back until maybe their parents need care or maybe they want their kids to be educated in Hawaii. That's the two number one that's, That's kind of the only thing pieces, right? bringing them yep, back. Pretty much. It's not that it's easy to live in it. Hawaii. It's not, you know, the climate. Yeah, but you could go other places and have similar climates. But it's either taking care of your parents or wanting your kids to experience what you had as a kid. But I just knew like right away that I wanted to live and work in Hawaii because I think I had those experiences early on. I also did a summer in Japan between my junior and senior year of high school. I stayed for six weeks with a host family. So it was an exchange program. My, my poor host parents barely knew any English, but it was on me, right, to be able to look and communicate. And that was also the summer that Princess Kiku, I think, got married. So that's all that was on the news. It was like watching Cinderella every day and just watching Japanese culture. I think me and my host sister, we would walk next door to the friend's house, like you know, maybe about a half mile away, play with fireworks on 4th of July, Hanabi, and go back. I mean, it was like one in the morning. She called her parents. It's like, oh yeah, just walk home. It was totally safe. And that experience really made me think about, right? Like just common respect, common courtesy. You're living in someone else's house. I think I called home once or twice in six weeks. And for, I'm thinking, gosh, would I let my my kid yeah, do that so without? So expensive too. I mean, yeah, to and call home from Japan. yeah, God. or to even like mail me something at the mm-hmm. time. But we still keep in touch, right? I send them a Christmas card every year. They send me Christmas cards. We've kept in touch, and just really like profound little moments that yeah, it was hard because I was like by myself. Some days were super lonely. It was also during the summer. I don't know if you've ever been to the summer in it was hot. July, August. Yeah, it's it's too, like it's hot, humid. 100 degrees and 100% humidity, no AC. It's pretty miserable. Yeah. <laughs> but not that I suffered through it, but like experiencing having to be independent, experiencing having to find your inner strength to get through those moments, I think really helped me through college because... By the time I went to college, it was like, oh, this is so fun. There's a lot of freedom, too. I was like, oh. Well, oh, so you travel kind of a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And thanks to Kamehameha, they paid for a lot of those trips and they allowed me scholarship money. So really, like, my parents didn't. I think that's why they said, yeah, go. I don't have to pay anything. Okay, go ahead. Wow. So I know you mentioned that you said your dad couldn't give you all these like material items. Mm-hmm. But if you consider like the greatest gift your father has given to you, what would you say it is? Oh, definitely an education, right? Ironically, he was the one that wanted all of us to go to Kamehameha. And I was like, oh, wait, I that's mom. My mom went to Kamehameha. He goes, no, but I mean, like he knew the value of Kamehameha. I think he couldn't afford Punahori Iolani at the time. So... That was what he could provide, right? And I remember asking him, because all my friends went to Kaiser during the summer for summer school, right? Easy credit, whatever. And he's like, absolutely not. You need to be challenged. You also need to work. You need to do this. So every summer I would go to summer school at Kamehameha and then teach swimming classes after, right? Because you end kind of early summer school. And so I, I was able to teach swimming. And that's, right, that was probably one of the first quote leadership positions that they gave me I wasn't technically an employee because I was too young but they're like oh yeah Diane wants to jump in the pool with the five-year-olds go at it right and so that helped me you know just get that first experience of 
responsibility for someone else, encouraging people. And this is the moment where like when five-year-olds are freaked out to get in a pool altogether yeah. and they're like clinging on to you, choking you. And you're just like, okay, you got this. is okay. You hang on to the end. You start with blowing bubbles. And then pretty soon by the end of the six-week course, they're doing laps. And to see big progress in such a short amount of time, I was like, wait, I had something to do with that. Like, that's kind of cool, right? That's kind of what led me into being, you know, like semi-leadership positions, right? Is you're being responsible for someone. So if you took the education out of it, then what would you say the greatest gift your father gave to you was? Oh, I'd say he would also cook dinner every night. So even though, right, he was like, you're here for dinner, he would cook and he would say, this is also my contribution to you that you have, right? Hot rice, you have a good meal. My job mostly was to wash rice. So to this day, I hate washing rice but <laughs> because also, I don't know if you guys do, he would make me dump the rice into a bucket and then that bucket, I would have to go water the plants, oh. right? So, right, and you know, because all of the nutrients yeah, yeah, yeah. that you yeah. basically wash out with the powder on the rice nourishes the plants but i was like can't i just wash it can i just dump it down the drain that's for the plants outside come on it's like okay right five gallon bucket outside yeah we could wash it but that was but that was a lesson i guess so yeah i guess we could one we used to wash everything with the holes right Mm -hmm. back then (laughs) yeah no i don't know about that no yeah but i'd say right his work ethic was the example for us and I think right in hindsight I'm sure he was much more of a hard ass than I would admit but I think it was that drive he would also drive me to school every day so from Aina Haina where I live now I live in the same house Aina Haina to Kamehameha he would drop me off at the you know up on campus which is like an extra 10 minute drive and I go you can drop me off at the terminal and I can catch the bus up the hill it's like I gotta make sure you get to school Mm-hmm. It's like, where else am I going to go, dad? You never know. <laughs> <laughs> or he would like give subtle hints about, you know, like, you know, Tantless is a really like scary place. And I was like, what? <laughs> you know, like <laughs> when when the lookouts, right, at night where there's no lights, he's like, kind of dangerous. Might he never not. like, what, you watch might want to avoid race. that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Abarembo Shogun all the time. Yeah. In fact, they're having a remake. Did you see that, I think? Of what? They're bringing it back. I think Kiku is replaying all of the old school oh. Abarembo Shogun um, episodes. No, I was saying submarine race, right? It's like, oh, watch the submarine races up, Tantalus. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I thought you said Samurai. <laughs> no, not Samurai. I said is that what that, the submarine race. <laughs> okay. Like, there's no ears. submarine yeah. races yes. up yeah. Tantalus. Yeah. Okay. No fireworks. Is your dad still alive? No, he passed in 2022 oh, in March. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's kind of during COVID-ish. Yeah. So, I, and I will say another pearl of wisdom from my dad that he didn't even know he dropped was during COVID, he was in a skilled nursing facility. I was working at Luna Lilo Home, and the only person that could visit him was me because I was vaccinated early, right? So I got vaccinated early on. Like right when the vaccines came out, that must have been January of 2021. He was in a skilled nursing facility and you had to be vaccinated in order to visit anybody. So because I got it early, I was the one. And I just remember my first visit with him, they were timed, right? So they were 30 minutes. And the first half hour was teaching him how to use a flip cell phone. He never, never carried a cell phone. He's like, here, dad, this is how you use a cell phone so that we can call you and you can call us without calling the nurse, having them. They would bring him like a cordless phone line and who knows who else was using that. So cross contamination. So, you know, like here's the flip phone. Here's the on button. Here's the back button. He's like, back button. What's a back button? I'm like. Oh, to go in reverse, right? So I'm explaining the basics. So that was the first 15 minutes. The second 15 minutes, he's explaining to me how he has a do not resuscitate clause and that if anything happens to him, 
I have to be, I'm going to get notified first and my mom and that we would have to coordinate the outcome. And I was like, holy crap, like 30 minutes, 15 minutes teaching a cell phone, another 15 minutes talking about a do not resuscitate clause. And then bing, there was a timer, your time's up. They wheel him upstairs. And it made me change my policy at Luna Lilo Home because I said, okay, 30 minutes. We can't handle anything more than 30 minutes. But I realized that 30 minutes is like blink of an eye. And if you want to see your loved one, like you kind of want to spend the whole day with them or you want to spend two hours with them. And so I realized at that point, like we cannot limit them to 30 minutes. 30 minutes does not give you enough confidence to know and assure yourself because when you have a parent in elder care, you are really entrusting them with a stranger, essentially, that you may not know. And so we did video chats at Luna Lilo Home during COVID, but that is not the same. And Kupuna are not used to talking to a screen. They think they're talking to a picture frame. And just like kindergartners or preschoolers, 10 minutes in, they'd be like, okay, what's next? I'm ready for the next thing. So I just realized how important it is for time, right? Just to have protected time with loved ones during COVID was just sparse because there was either a clock or a barrier. I mean, and yeah, and even at that, when we, in those 30 minutes, I was talking to him through like this setup, but with a plexiglass screen between us, he couldn't hear me so well because of the plexiglass screen. And I'm sure if somebody was a fly on the wall during that conversation, they would have laughed in the first 15 minutes and then cried in the second 15 minutes. And I think that's what really made me think about, right, how important it is to connect to people, how important face-to-face meetings are. Hybrid meetings are excellent when you already know the person, but if you're meeting them for the first time, all you need to do is focus on what's up here. And there's a screen, there's a physical distance between two people. And to me, Hawaii is all about Pilina. It's all about relationships. We just found two degrees of separation from us this morning, and it's like inevitable, right? I thought that two degrees was through your sister-in-law, but it's really through your classmates, right? And um, maybe my mom. And that, and yeah, and your mom. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I'm gonna go call my mom right after this. <laughs> so was that the last time you saw your dad? No. So he had been there for almost a year in the sniff, in and out. And then he was at Kuakini, which ironically was the same place that my grandmother passed. And so the last interaction was at the hospital. And they were actually so gracious. And actually, he had a room to himself because I think they weren't as crowded. If he were at Queens, I guaranteed he would have had a shared room and we would have had limited visits. But we were able to see him in his final hours. And actually, the physicians were so kind that they're like, you know, supposed to only have like two to three visitors a day. Like, sure, like all six of you can see him and my auntie and my cousin. I mean, we went in like two at a time, but it was helpful to say goodbye. Was he still like coherent? No, no. So we talked to him. And I think during that time when he was in the hospital, My daughter got into Irvine, and so, right, we would just sit at his bedside and update him on the kids, right, because he really wanted to see them go to college. And actually, when at the funeral, all the grandkids spoke, and my middle daughter, they wrote a speech out. She goes, yeah, Papa started talking to me about college when I was, like, in third grade. I had no idea what college was, but I do now, right? And and so I was just like, he did? (laughs) Like... Oh my gosh, right? And so I think he saw that same, right, the value of education in us, me, my sister, my brother, and in five nieces, now six. We had six. So when you mention that experience with your father during COVID, it's kind of a moving story. What's the most moving memory you have of him? Kaimana Beach, we're in the water. And we used to play this game called tree. And my dad would, we would, me and my sister would balance, stand on either side of his shoulder. And he'd be the tree and then we'd jump off. Oh my gosh, you're really going to 
make us cry on this, <laughs> aren't you? I'm, not, I'm just providing <laughs> space. Come on a we're beach. in the zone. But no. you know what? I have to say, he would always call it San Susie. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, I yeah. knew it as San Susie Beach growing up. Because the hotel or what? Yeah. yeah and yeah. then I don't know when. Do they? Do people still call it San Susie mm-hmm. Beach? Okay. So I don't know when there was this transition and now it's Kaimanas and I, I'll take my kids there. But I just distinctly remember like that was our beach. I do remember like we lived in Haina. We would come around Diamond Head where the lookout is. We were in his old green duster. This is before seatbelts and before car seats. Me and my sister, I remember along Diamond Head Road, we jump into the front seat and back. We were pretending we were mermaids and we would just go back and forth. And I think back to, I was like, God, how dangerous was that? Like how many miles per hour was dad going? Right. And just like no seatbelts jumping in and out of like in the front seat, into the back seat, back and forth as if it were a game while the car's moving. Now we like locked. Right? That's the fun times, right? Yeah. So how about your mom then? What would be your most favorite memory with your mom? I'd say it's probably the more recent ones. Last year, I went with the Weinberg Foundation to Israel and my mom was my guest. So my mom, I'd say she's like this world traveler. After she retired from UH, she, I think she read every single book in the whole world for the first four months, like didn't come out of the house and we're like, mom, you all right? (laughs) Like, what are you doing? And then she went on all these travels and... Um, was she grieving her role or what was it? I think it was like she finally had the time to read all the books that she wanted to read, right? And because she didn't have the obligation of her day job, mm-hmm. she could. she just get up and, and do whatever you want in retirement. Then she started traveling a lot. She went to places like Kuala Lumpur, Egypt. Singapore, Japan, Vietnam, and she would go with friends or family. And then she also made friends on trips and went with other people. I remember one trip she went on to Egypt. You have to sign almost like this uh, waiver. And I had to sign it. And I'm like, what am I signing? Because, well, you know, if anything happens to me, I was like, what do you mean if anything happens to me? She went to Egypt. Came back two days later. There was a protest in one of the large squares in Cairo. I was like, okay, that's why I signed the paperwork. But she knew that she wanted to see the world. And I'm so glad she had that opportunity to do it. And so when I had that opportunity to go to Israel with the Weinberg Foundation, she was my guest. And my poor husband, he had to stay home with the kids, right? But it was really like... It wasn't on her bucket list, but to see Jerusalem, to see the wall, to see, I mean, they take you on this whirlwind one week trip and you learn about Israel and Palestine. We were right there at the border of the Gaza Strip looking out and you could see the buildings, those same buildings that you see getting blown up on the news. And then we stopped off in Germany to see my cousin who she helped take care of when he was little. He's a number of years older than me. And just being able to spend that time together, the fun parts, the frustrating parts with, you know, like she's a little bit slower. So I'm like, okay, mom, come on. We can't miss the bus. I'm not missing the bus. But being able to see her travel because I wasn't able to go with her on all those other ones. I wanted to, but like we're working, we're raising kids. My kids were young. That, I think, was one of the more memorable parts for my mom and for me, right? Like, now we have that memory together. And we talk about, like, you know, when the war in Gaza started, I was like, Mom, like, did you see where these events are happening? Like, we were right there when we were talking about why we had to travel with a security detail. And I remember, like, catching a glimpse, like, the guy packed a gun, on the bu- he's on the bus with us at every stop all the way. And when I think back to what happened in the south part of Israel, I was like, I don't think that guy could have done anything for us had riots occurred like in that fashion. And to think that was that event last October was five months after we visited Israel. So I was like, 
right? When you think about it, you're like, okay, these guys had that plan while we were standing at that lookout. Like anything could have happened. And really when we talk about it, it's like, why are people so polar opposite? And one of the questions of the tour was, can Israel and Palestine ever find peace? And I walked away from that trip thinking, probably not, right? And then five months later, you have this huge war breakout. And it's because people were uncompromising. And I think that element is so critical. So right, I'm thinking about what does that mean here in Hawaii when we have conflict or when we have distinct polar views of things, Mauna Kea, Red Hill, all of these things are very polarizing, but To me, the only way that you find resolution is that there has to be some degree of compromise. And when we as humans cannot do that, then it's hard to even come to the table. When when we learn in Ho'oponopono, when you come to the table, you both are coming intending to at least discuss the issue. You may not resolve it the way you want it to be resolved, but you come to the table with that intent. And I could see elements of Israel and elements of Palestinian governments that they would not be able to come to the table. One person might want to, but the other one won't. Or when the other one wants to, then that's not my time that I want to come to the table. So where have you seen that happen either in your life or in your, you know, the businesses that you run? And how did you deal with that i don't know if it would be as as huge as or where do you see a polarization happening an example i'd say would be during tmt mauna kea this was 2019 this was pre-covid and at the culmination of that right so when the kupuna blocked the road and got arrested by dlnr i was at lunalilo home at the time and I wanted to put out a press release on behalf of Luna Lilo Trust because to me, our lane was Kupuna Care, right? And what I wanted to say was that super unfortunate how Kupuna were arrested. I'm thankful that the DLNR, right? Like they, they weren't tossing around. They were, I'd say, respectful in more ways than not. But at the same time, look at these Kupuna who are sticking up, not just for themselves, but for the people that they know cannot afford to get arrested and bailed out because they have day jobs or they have kids to take care of. And in that moment, I was like, damn, look at these kupuna. They're putting themselves on the line because they understand what's at risk for the other employed people who really want to do it, right? But they're like, nope, that's not your kuleana at this moment. This is my kuleana. And I think the polarizing came from People not understanding why the kupuna put themselves in that, right? They're like, oh, so dumb those kupuna. Why they got to always get arrested, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, actually, guys, don't you see? They were brilliant. They took the heat for others that they knew could not, in a way, afford to become arrested, even though they were willing to get arrested. And what a display of leadership, right? So people are like, Dan, what are you on? Are you crazy? Getting arrested is a form of leadership. I was like, well, think about it, right? Like they have a little bit less to lose than the other people who really wanted to chain themselves, right? And it was a moment for me where I saw the community only see one side of the story and not necessarily understand the depth of why when you are so passionate about something that you are willing to potentially break the law and I realize when I say that I'll probably get you know some knocks here and there but what I saw in the kupuna getting arrested on the Mauna was a show of leadership and heroism and kuleana to be able to take on a responsibility at that moment without fear and allowing others in the community to then okay now I know what my kuleana is like I'm gonna go work on the legal aspects of it. I'm going to go work on the community gatherings. I'm going to go work on holding space and doing ceremony, right? So the brilliance of that moment for Kupuna allowed everybody else to recognize a role that they had in this particular struggle. 
and elevate the cause and elevate and educate us. So what was polarizing, right, was I'm not only going to blame the media, but many of the media stories were protesters, anger, you know, like as if Hawaiians are just flailing their arms and not thinking about the consequences. I'm like, we are absolutely looking at the consequences. And it wasn't until later, uh, this is actually earlier, PCF um, classmates and mine, we were able to meet. We always would try and look at two sides of the story. Um, Kaho'okahi Kanuha, who is one of the Mauna leaders, was also my daughter's preschool teacher at Punana Leo. He was a rising graduate student at the time. And I asked him to come to speak to us. And I remember amongst all of the brilliant things that he said was, okay, if you're going to build a telescope or if you build anything and you chop off the top of that mountain, the stories of that mountain, the name of that mountain disappears. And it's not like you can just put, you know, we can decommission a telescope and take it off the mauna, but are you going to put the pu'u, are you going to put that peak back on the mountain afterwards and be able to retell the same stories and be able to rebuild the mauna in a sense? And that kind of hit me like right in the gut, like, oh crap, right? So it's not just the mauna, it's our land, right? Anything that we put a building on, do we lose the marsh underneath it? I live in Wailupe Valley. Modern name is Aina Haina. And Wailupe Peninsula, right? It's a marked, really nice homes, all of them over a million dollars, used to be a fish pond. So they took that fish pond, which was the refrigerator, the source of food. Wailupe means kite water. So right, this, our that front area is known for blustery winds, but really good for kite flying. That whole peninsula is filled in that used to be the fish pond and so I don't think there will ever be a point where those homes will be gone and it'll be restored to a fish pond again and it just made me start to think about things like that when he said like yeah you can take down anything and put a building on it but is the building ever going to come down and are you ever going to restore what it was back to the olden days Waikiki, Lo'i Kalo, um, right, Kalo Fields it did, right and in that teachable moment, right? Like your education and your enlightenment allows you to view things in other ways. And so when I look at polarizing things, oh my gosh, let's just look at our national government. I try and understand the other side of the story a little bit better. I try to see where they are coming from. And I always think that there's always more education that can be done in order to help others see the other side. But you also have to be willing to learn the other side. And that's what the Weinberg Foundation did think, right? They didn't show us just one side of Israeli pride. They also showed us Palestinian struggle and Palestinian pride. And so those two dichotomies, they can coexist in the world. But does it cause conflict? Yes, all the time. Does it allow us to take sides on a superficial level? Yeah, right? Like... I don't know. My, my husband's a Cowboys fan, right? Like, <laughs> talk about polarizing viewpoints. And try ask on the um on the Mauna, right? On if somebody doesn't have any idea on it, like, what is the significance and why is it so important to so, Native Hawaiians? Yeah. So Mauna Awakea, Mauna Kea, it's also one of the tallest peaks in the in the world. Mauna Kea is at the elevation that we call an Akua dwelling right so and like this is part of the brilliance right we live close to the ocean because we know that's a resource we can live up in the mountains but the peaks of the mountains Vau Akua that's the space of the gods right they knew that you couldn't necessarily live up there because of course the oxygen content is low and because it's a peak it's a sacred space right so that is where many burials took site it's the place that you could go kind of like a with religious like a pilgrimage yeah pilgrimage to a temple or i mean a vahipana a sacred site so is that where the veil between like the spirit realm and ordinary reality is that what um, it is i'm sure that there are portals there i mm. guess for lack of a better word portals i actually think that there are spirits that dwell everywhere mm -hmm. but i'd say i mean in my mind that's where most of them dwell and that's because it is 
closest or where the to... veil is thinner yeah somehow yeah, yeah yeah and that to hawaiians is important because in hawaiian culture you know your mo'okuo how you know your genealogy and all genealogies trace back to the gods it's your tether to your ancestors and it's your tether to that insight that your ancestors hold and we believe i mean or i believe that they are sending you messages in the same way that you pule to them right like when someone is sick you want to offer a blessing or a prayer you put it out into the universe i believe that something actually happens with that message and it goes somewhere not everybody does but it's like when you say like oh i haven't seen nolan in so long watch i can run into him at longs right or costco or, or kahala mall that's where i usually end up seeing it and it's because i put that intent out there it's because i put that message out there it goes somewhere and i think right i mean i don't know coconut wireless somebody says hey so like dan you, is hasn't seen no if you cut the peak anymore. then you're cutting the connection yeah you're and removing then now that now we no longer have connection to our past exactly our ancestry and essentially ourself yeah it's like it's like you're tearing down the temple right in a way which you can always say right like, oh, the temple is in you it's not in these physical spaces but for Hawaiians the land and the aina are those physical spaces they are representation of our akua and they are the messages my kumu snowbird always says that hula is like the powerpoint of our ancestors right so these are the physical pinpoints that we can show and see with our own eyes that is placed there by something higher than us and we have this reciprocity with the with the aina with the world right like you take care of the land the land is going to take care of you well i also heard too that the trees and so on they're like half our lungs mm -hmm. right because mm -hmm. we breathe out carbon mm -hmm. dioxide they breathe it in and then send back out oxygen we breathe that so, in the oceans and exactly. so on and all that right we cannot so, live just by ourselves so what and what i've learned in hula right for as an example one of many laka is the deity of hula in the western world right we picture her she's female but in hawaiian she is manifested by the forest right and through laka we understand the transpiration process right so evaporation condensation precipitation my, my daughters would have this song for this in science we sweat we exude our sweat equity into the land it goes up into the heavens it comes back down as rain which is our primary source of life which is water clean water and when we dance hula when we adorn ourselves with the palapalai the ferns the ie ie, the maile, those are what we call kino lao, which are physical manifestations of the gods. And by wearing them, right, we become and we imbue all of those things in nature. In a sense, in a very simplistic way of thought, we become the forest, right? And when we do that, we tell the stories of the forest. We tell the stories of our ancestors, and that reminds us and, and also kind of gives us like how we should act, how we should behave, how we should respect the land. And I think in, the, in a lot of Native cultures, not just Native Hawaiian, right? Native Indian, Native Aboriginal. If you look at some of the common threads through all Native cultures is this very distinct relationship with the land. And because we work the land, you understand it a little bit better. Like the trees in your front yard, right? When you pay attention to them, when you ask them to give fruit, <laughs> or when you say, I kind of don't like how much you're shedding all over, and I got to rake up your leaves all the time, right? Like they can hear you and, and they're living beings and they are a part of your ohana, right? Like in our front yard, we have a mango tree. When I say like, oh, can you just not like give us junk fruit, right? You're asking, you're talking to them, but you're asking does it work something. On that? Does and it work? Sometimes it does. Yeah. With the connection to the land, can you think of a personal story where you've seen this in action? I mean, I talk about my mango tree all the time. 
So my mango tree has been there ever since my grandparents built the house. When we moved in, it was one of the first things that my husband, I'm going to call him out. My husband wanted to cut down the tree because at the time, our first year that we moved in, I mean, I lived there my whole life, but the first year that me and my husband moved in and lived there, so much mangoes, like at least two dozen a day were picking up off the ground. So he wants to cut it down because you have too much mangoes. Too much mangoes, which brings the birds, which brings the rats, which, right, all all those other fun stuff. Right right? now. (laughs) But that was the only year that it did that because I think he was like, what is this? Like so much rubbish, right? It was super smelly, fruit flies for months, and critters, right? And then the next couple years after that, no mangoes whatsoever. Maybe a small late harvest in October, 12 mangoes max. And then we had threatened to kind of like, okay, we got to cut it back. Like it's just too much work. And we have, we had with young kids, maintenance, getting too big. It's growing to the power lines. So we cut it back and then didn't have mangoes for a while. And then we wanted to cut it back even more. He wanted to take it out completely. And then that following season, ukubillion um, mangoes again. And I was like, oh, I think that the tree hurt us. Okay, I'm going to give you the best mangoes ever. I kid you not. They were better than those Makaha gold mangoes. No strings, no hairs, creamy, creamy, like just perfect mangoes. And I was like, I got you. I got you. <laughs> I got you. We're not cutting you down, right? And ever since then, you know, we talked to the tree. That, 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 that was a tree that I played in as a kid. We had swing sets on it. We always wanted to build a tree house for my kids. But then I was like, oh, man, like, all the mangoes are going to fall on the tree house. And, but to me, right, like they're listening. I don't, I don't know if you've ever seen people talk to their plants, right? Like I talked to my peacock bush and it produces, right? And of course... My scientific side is saying, right, the carbon dioxide that I emit to the plant helps with the respiration process at night when I'm watering. But it's that connection to living things, whether they be animals or plants or people, is so important. It's the thing that tethers us and unites us. And to me, that's what makes us so special that we, in some ways, I don't know if I go, I could say We control the weather, right? We can control the elements, right? Like, oh my gosh, please don't rain on my kid's birthday party at the beach. And it holds and we leave the beach and then downpour. But it's that intent, right? And it's that the things that we can't see that kind of all you have to do is ask. I wouldn't say it works every time, but it allows you to have this relationship with your environment, which is pretty much the foundation of Hawaiian culture, right? They knew this aina so well. They knew where the best surf spots were. They knew where the best fishing spots were. They knew where the really choice ono mango is. And my dad's side of the family is lelehua, wahewa. They do have the best lychee, I will say that. Because I also found out lychee needs cold winters and then they fruit in the spring. And I was just like, oh, is that like just an old wives' tale? I was like, no, this is like scientific evidence, but it's manifested in mo'olelo and stories that get passed on for generations and generations. Actually, I think the people that I think that are the most br- brilliant in terms of recognizing that in a scientific means were the Chinese, right? They knew how to farm in order to support their economy and to support their livelihood millions and millions of people right calendar the lunar moon all of those innate things they were one with their environment so they knew how to take care of their environment so that their environment would produce the sustenance necessary to maintain life so when we speak about like mo'olelo what are the most meaningful or impactful mo'olelo that you hold I'd say it's probably the mo'olelo of what I realized in, I think it was 2016. I'd been dancing hula for, I say forever. And the IUCN um, Conservation Congress 
was being held in Hawaii. And we were learning specific mele for the opening ceremonies. And this kind of training was, I mean, we were preparing for this ceremony. So it was very different from training for Mary Monarch or training for a competition or training for a trip to practicing for a trip to Japan. This was learning mele that was outside of our school. So it was through the Kanaka Oles, Halao Kekuhi, very different style, like duck walks for days. My knees were all bust up. I, I took photos. I could barely drive home that night after practice. But that experience of learning different mele and then doing the ceremony, doing the kapu, the restrictions right before the ceremony, and then actually performing the ceremony kind of made me think twice about what the purpose, uh, like why was I dancing hula, right? Like hula back in high school was really just the extracurricular activity. And over time, through uniki, through this, it became a process. And this became a way of life. And it solidified for me the importance of ceremony and ritual in what we do. And so most people, when they see hula, they're like, oh, so pretty. That's a one hour. Kahiko, oh, yeah, I love Kahiko. So bombastic, right? Sharp angles. And I was like, well, yes, like that is the visual element behind hula. But in doing the uniki processes and in doing this ceremony, it became a spiritual journey and it became something that is kind of like more tethered to me internally than the exertion of physical activity and just like sweating for two hours at a time. And so the ceremony finished and I remember looking at my kumu who was really adamant about, okay, like there are no mistakes, right? Like, I mean, there's no mistakes on Mary Monarch stage. Yes, we got it, right? You're focusing. But this one was like, you're not performing for judges. You're not performing for an audience. You are performing for the Akua, like you are here because these Akua understand conservation and they are going to be present. And when she said that, you're just, okay, like, I won't screw up. <laughs> like, like, I'm going to know my stuff so well, there is no glitch. And it just felt so good, right? To be able to do your craft, to dance for ancestors that you knew were present in the room but you couldn't physically see them, right? The audience that was there, they're like flies on the wall, right? I guess I was at that point in my life where it was so much more meaningful that it just filled my na'al, filled my guts and my soul with pride and with a higher level of understanding that I was like, oh, I wish everybody could feel like this when they do whatever it is, whether it's a martial art or a sport like, this is what I think it's like to be fulfilled in a way that everything else, like, kind of fell into place. Because right after that was when I actually left Queens and I got the CEO job at Luna Lilo Home. My kids were thriving. My family was good. I had come out of breast cancer and it was like, okay, like, damn, this is where life begins, Right. And so I think if you, I, mean, I don't know, maybe it could have been a midlife crisis too, but it's an opportunity, right? And I just remember thinking like, God, if I feel like this, like how do others, just, uh, you know, dancing alongside me feel like going through something together, making the discipline time and an energy to do something like that, right? I still had a day job. I still had young kids to take care of. I, it was like a luxury to be able to have that kind of fulfillment, which led me to like, right, like, okay, how do I keep this up? How do I recognize that? And how do I maintain it? Like, how do I have a little bit more of that in there? How do you maintain it? How do you Um, integrate ceremony into your life and into the companies that you run and so on? How do you do that? It's the discipline, right, of putting down your head and doing hard work. I still do hula every Sunday. But how do you bring that to the group? So I guess in my work, it's the regular check-ins, right? Like, are we all on the same page? What is the next big challenge that we need to get through? What is the preparation that we need, right? 
So in, in prepping for a ceremony, there are certain aspects, right? Either food-wise, health-wise, compartmentalizing things to a certain degree, and then having that actual event. So at work, it's that preparation, right? Like, is everybody on the same page? Do people know what the goal is? Do people know how to prepare in their own departments and divisions on how this goal is going to get me achieved? And then you go through all of those same steps. It takes a little bit longer, probably. There's always like rabbit holes to go down, but it's finding that common goal. And right, like, so my kumu was able to do this. The goal is to accomplish this ceremony on this day. And in the same way at work, right, we have a transition day where we are switching over systems. And so what is the prep that needs to be done in order to execute on this particular day? I see it as our regular meetings are the ceremony in a sense and the preparation for practice, right? You're practicing for a moment that's going to happen. And then after that, what do you do? Like, yeah, you practice for the next moment and then the next one and then the next. So if you take like a Hawaiian based kind of value that is really important to you, what would it be? And then how do you integrate that into your workplace? I wouldn't say it's a traditional value, but I'm always talking about pilina, right? Or so pilina connection. So pili means to like stick and na is like the formative, making it into a noun kind of. So Pilina is always making these connections, right? And I think back to my grandma who died when I was like one. She was a telephone operator. And I have a picture of my mom has a picture of her with the earpiece and going way back. Like the kids nowadays are not going to know what I'm talking about. But a switchboard, right? She would take in one switch. Oh, I need to connect it to whatever, right? You're literally plugging in and connecting people on the other side. So I like to think of myself as like that connector, through pilina, through relationships, through the degrees of association that you have with someone. We do it all the time, right? Like, okay, what high school you went, right? There's a certain pilina to that. What college did you go to? Who do you work for? What's your ohana name again, right? So there are these buckets of pilina. And to me, that is one of the most important things because we live in a small island with limited resources. You have to have relationships, in order to survive, right? So like if you lived by the ocean, you had access to fish and pakai. If you lived in the mountains, you had access to all of the mountain fruits, pig hunters, right? Like, And that reciprocity, that pilina between those who lived on the coastal side and those who lived way in the valleys, they would have to have these relationships in order to exchange goods, right? Or exchange thoughts. And to me, In the business world, I know sometimes we get all like tense over like the associations and it's who you know in Bishop Street that gets you places. And to a certain degree, yes, that pilina is important, but it's pilina and using that pilina, that connection for good, that I think is what we should all be focusing on. And we see it in elements in the government. We see it in corporations we see it in charitable giving but it's like it's the thing that connects us like you cannot live on an island and be alone right we're kind of cramped quarters especially on Oahu I guess so we have to have these connections with other people it's what I think makes humans thrive right without without a relationship with other people how do you survive how do you have that connection so do you have a personal story that can describe how Pilina has worked in your life? I would say at Luna Little Home, I mean, you're caring for somebody else's ohana. And what was most awesome for me was when some of my staff would call upon their family to help us with imu. So when I was there, we started a Thanksgiving imu. What started off as just like, okay, can we do this? Can we try it out? What do we have? We have a lot of land. We have a couple of buildings. But that land could be used for traditional emu pit. So the pilina was, I had known about Auntie Tammy and Uncle Danny through Hale Kealoha. I know her father. 
Her father was a retired fireman who would do Ipono workshops, so eating healthy. He's a former fireman, so he's always cooking. He was the first person I've ever seen debone a chicken with one knife and in one single piece without chopping off any of the, you know, like, a, I don't know, you know, like a rotisserie chicken, uncooked. He flipped it inside out, deboned it, flipped it back, and I was like, you can do that? <laughs> so anyways... Having her as my dietary manager, she understood the importance of native foods. So she brought kalo and ulu back into the diets of these kupuna who hadn't really tasted this kind of stuff since they were kids. And I was like, hey, Tammy, I have an idea. Like, I really want to do an emu. I, I mean, one, I think it would be so fun. And two, like Kailua High School does it as a fundraiser. It's, we can probably transition to a fundraiser of some sort. So through her pilina, her contact and her ohana, right, she brought the Pico gang, which is her ohana, and they basically did the emu for us, right? I mean, I knew conceptually how to do an emu, but I had never really seen it from start to finish. I'm usually either the one helping in the beginning, putting it in, right? You got to wait overnight. And I could be on the morning crew and then pulling it out of the emu. And I'm um, usually the pork shredder, right? With the two forks and you're shredding the meat. So through her pilina, right, she was able to bring a gang of people to do this. Now, what happened after that was kind of magical because, right, you go through the process, putting it in at night. And over the years, we started to have the Kaiser kids because Kaiser High School is right next door. Kaiser kids basketball team come and help us. And I'd be like, oh, what are these kids doing here, right? And then pretty soon, like, other people would come and like, hey, Dan, how's it? I'm, I'm here to help. I'm like, oh, like, how did you know we were having a emu? Well, you know, like, so-and-so, Tammy's friend, right? And cousin, blah, 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 right? And then it just becomes, like, this community network. And literally, they're there to move rocks, right? So I'm like, without Pilina, these people would have never happened, like, I would have never been able to do this alone with my staff only, right? It takes a village. And I think the defining moment for me about Pilina was we had made friends with some of the neighbors in the area because Luna Lilo is kind of at the end of a cul-de-sac. So all of the neighbors, every time we have a luau or an event, their parking gets taken. So we, right, I went door to door to say, hey, sorry, we're having this event, just letting you know Traffic's going to be kind of crowded from this time to this time, right? But I'm building Pilina with them. So that morning, somebody comes and he's standing on the side, but he's not helping. So I was like, okay, like, hey, uncle, how are you doing? You, you okay? He goes, I'm 60 something years old. I've never seen this before in my life. I eat Kalua pig all the time, but I never knew this is like what people do to make it, right? I was like, well, ha, 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 you can make it in the stove, right? You can put a pork butt in the oven, wrap it in tea leaf. He goes, no, no, no. I've lived here my whole life. I eat Kolo pig all the time. I've never seen this before. This is unreal. Thank you so much. And at that moment, I'm like, oh, my gosh. I was just able to give this connection for this uncle who's lived in Hawaii Kai his whole life who's eaten Kulua pig his whole life. Had a teachable moment on this is how an emu is made. So he saw it, them, right, fire it up, close it up, came back the next morning. He had put in a turkey because it's Thanksgiving, turkey emu. He pulled it out and he's like, hey, sister, thank you so much. This blew my mind. This is awesome. I'm going to support you guys every year. And so now our Pilina tethers him to some element of Luna Lilo home, which was just a care home to him before that. Now we were an educational resource. We were a resource for food. If he ever had questions, he knew he could come and talk to us. And if he ever needed kupuna caregiving, we're right there in his neighborhood. And that for me was like, holy cow, I can't believe what just happened, right? That was not any intent that I had, really, I was thinking like, oh, this would be a great fundraiser, right? This would be really fun. You guys do emu all the time, right? Like, it brings people together. And so when you do that, right, you have new friends, you have new contacts, you have new resources. And then, yeah, the island gets a little bit smaller, but that's why we're on the island. I think that's why we all live here is because we want that 
Pilina, we want that tether to our families, to the generations in the past, to the generations to come. And that's why Pilina for me is the number one value, I guess, or concept that I can instill in my kids, I can instill in my organization, and I can instill in the community. How about another story that demonstrates Pilina between you and your ancestry? So the Pilina between me and my ancestors, okay, the concept of, it's a saying that I heard, it's from a Native American story, and I'm sure many people have heard it. We are what our ancestors, our grandmothers dreamed of. So the Pilina that I think everybody in Hawaii has, some just may not be aware of it or know it or take the time to dig into it, really is learning and understanding what our ancestors have done for us to be sitting here today. I mean, we joke around to my kids, when we, like, oh my gosh, you're so lucky to be alive because if I didn't meet your father, right? Like, boom. And then when you start thinking about your parents and how they got together, we talked a little bit about how my parents, they met at UH Manoa and how there was a little bit of tension between my mom and my grandma because my mom wasn't Asian or she wasn't Japanese. I'd say that's the main thing. She was Chinese, but that wasn't kind of good enough for my grandma. And then you think back to, okay, so my grandparents didn't necessarily graduate from high school. They were born on the plantation and most of them were like, we did carpentry work, you know, like blue collar work. And then I think back, okay, one more generation. They were the ones who probably came over straight to the sugarcane or sugarcane plantations, both Japanese and Chinese sides. And I was like, okay. So when I started looking, when my mom started doing genealogy, it was, huh, my great, great, great grandfather was a translator in Kalakaua's government. So he was a Chinese translator. And when we look on the manifest, right, you can look up the manifest of the boats when they came. He came over with four kids. I was like, that's kind of unusual because usually you send one and then the rest of the family comes. But he was able to bring wife and four kids. I was like, okay, that's kind of unusual. My husband loves genealogy too. He found the manifest with his Filipino grandparents coming to Hawaii to work on the plantation. And so that, right, the physical pilina that we have is like, okay, we are descendants, literal biological descendants of them. But when I think about what they did to get here, right, I'm like, oh my gosh, I had it good, right? Like I didn't have to work on a plantation field. I didn't have to catch a boat for a month to come to a tiny island that I didn't know how to speak the language. The pilina that tethers me to them is that you got to tell their stories. You got to, you have to first know your story, know their stories, and then be able to share those stories with them. Because I'm sure if we went back far enough, we'd probably be related. Like I kind of think like we're related to everybody here in some way, shape or form. That's the Pilina, right? The two degrees of separation. But if you go back far enough, we're all related, right? And if you think in Hawaiian culture, what tethers me to that is hula, right? And hula is the tool that I use to connect to my ancestors. And it's not just my own personal ohana, but it's the ohana of the halau that I belong to and the kumu that have predated my arrival to the halau. And I think the best part about that is that it keeps our ancestors relevant in our minds and their ike, their knowledge, and their insight of the way they viewed the world is written in these mele and hula that we get to, in a way, decode, right? So you take a traditional chant, a traditional mele, like kaulilua. It, it's known as one of the staples of the hula pahu, the drum. And when we dissect the words, we can interpret it one way. We may not know the way the composer interpreted it, but we can find relevance in it today. So when we deconstruct some of these songs in Mele, they're talking about struggle of land. They're talking about how do I live in an ever-changing modern world 
while maintaining tradition. They're talking about the elements and the rain and the winds that remind us of what it was like living in those times. So to me, that hula is the conduit and that tool that helps me keep tethered to the ancestors. And why is that even important? It's like, why wouldn't I want to learn about what was learned 200 years ago? Because there is always going to be relevance in those lessons today. So I'm thinking like kaulilua, right? It's about insight and knowledge. We start looking at it in different ways. And then without going too far deep, right? Like it could be affiliated with, okay, here's a process of childbirth. Here is the process of growth and rebirth. But I never looked at it that way when I first learned it almost 20, 30 years ago. I was like, it's kind of mind blowing when you look at it in a different way. And then it also helps me tether to the future, right? So to me, Pilina is ever changing. It's not static that we're here just for a short amount of time. I may feel old, but you know, 50 years is nothing in terms of perpetuity. So I'm going to try and intake all that I can while I can. And then I'm going to help pass that on to the next generation. Because what I am is I'm a part of this long, long lineage and legacy that my role is to make sure that it gets carried on to the next generation. And that importance of Pilina, right? The I have to know what was behind me in order to pass it forward. And so I hope, you know, my kid's probably not as deep right yet, but when I think back to my high school, college years, hula really was like an extracurricular activity. It was a social event for me. It, it tethered me to Hawaii. And I think that's like the most coolest thing to know that your ancestors are standing behind you, pushing you forward, and that you're going to do the exact same thing when you get to that point in the trajectory of life. So the last piece, I think, in this theme of Pilina is can you share either a story or memory where you either cultivated or developed the Pilina with yourself? The Pilina with myself is definitely from... I'll say it like right off, and I talk about this all the time, so we'll see if I can get through it. 2014 rocked my world. I've always been in healthcare, breast self exams every month because my grandmother died of breast cancer. My maternal auntie had breast cancer at 50. And so I'm kind of like, all right, it's inevitable. I just didn't expect it to get it at 40. So at 40, I had the three kids already, but they're three, six, and nine. And nothing like mortality to kick you in the ass and be like, okay, what are you going to do now? And so I think with Pilina, with myself, it was understanding, right? Like I work in the medical field. I was at Queens at the time, right? I could detach myself and like, okay, I'm going to be the model patient, right? And I'm going to do all these things. I have the resources. I work at Queens. I can literally call a geneticist. I can call an oncologist. In fact, I work with the oncologist. But the hardest part about a cancer diagnosis, and everybody who's ever been diagnosed with anything knows that moment where you realize what that diagnosis means. And you remember the sights and the smells. So I was actually picking up my daughter from preschool. My doctor had called me. I take the call in the car. And he goes, hey, are you driving? I'm like, yeah, why? You got bad news for me? I got to pull over or what? Ha ha. He's like, it's dead silent. I was like, oh, crap. Okay, I'm pulling over right now. And I pulled over. I pulled into the stall at the preschool. It was a red brick wall. It was about 4.30 p.m. So the light is, the afternoon sunshine is shining on that wall. You're just staring at the wall. It's carcinoma, Diane. I'm going to set you up. I'll give you a couple of names so you can go see an oncologist and a surgeon, right? Basically, kind of that was the end of the conversation. Like, eh, I think my doctor said, yeah, you'll be okay, right? Like, we'll get this. We got you. Click. And I'm sitting there. I was like, I can't go in there now. Like, I got to pick up my daughter. I got to say hi to everybody. I think it was our turn to clean. 
and put on a leo, you got to clean the classrooms. But at that point, and the hardest part about cancer diagnosis too is telling other people, right? Oh, uh, sorry, I can't go on that camping trip. Oh, why? Oh, I'm going to be having surgery. Oh, what? Right? And then you have like this, the plethora of reactions ranging from breakdown crying with you to, I'll never forget this one, my good friend's like, no worries, Diane, we're going to get this. Whatever you need, we got you. We're going to get through this, right? And everything in between. The pilina you have to have with yourself is the strongest because, and what my oncologist said is, we're going to all support you. Think of it like a boxing match, right? We are going to equip you with everything that you need. When you go through cancer, you're in the ring by yourself. I can throw in the towel for you. I can cheer from you on the sidelines. You can come back, right? And you know, I guess they look the ice, the press, whatever, the mouth guard. But he goes, but you're in the ring by yourself. And so without Pilina and settling your own na'au, your insides, knowing that everybody is out there, they're rooting for you. And then you're shy, like, I got to get better because all these people are here for the match, right? Like, oh God, I can't just give up, even though you want to sometimes. That to me is one of the biggest lessons of Pilina with myself is getting myself to a better place. And when you think back to pre-diagnosis, I remember at the time at work, I was always worried about kids, dinner, pickup, schedule, extracurricular activities, A+. And then when I was at home, I was always like, okay, got to do this email, got to prep for this board meeting, got to do that. And I was just constantly missing being present in the time. And I really feel like that breast cancer diagnosis was my kupuna's way of saying, slap, 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 wake up, Diane. You are not in any given place. When you're at work, your mind is at home. When you're at home, your mind is at work. And they're never going to hit in the middle and be perfect. And it took a lot to realize that, but... It was one of the best things that ever happened. Mind you, I caught it early. So nine days from finding a lump, I had the diagnosis. I had the biopsy, the ultrasound diagnosis in my hand. I immediately took action. I didn't like play it down like, okay, it's nothing. I'll just wait next month, see if it's still there. I was like, oh no, my family history, I'm on it. And I think it saved me from doing full chemotherapy. It was stage one. When I found it, I opted for bilateral mastectomy and it took me out. I remember not being able to lift my arms beyond like three inches thinking, holy crap, am I ever going to dance hula again? Like, how am I ever going to dance hula again if I can't even lift my hand up? And it was just such a profound moment in my life. And I always tell this story with my kids because it helps lighten the moment and it also helps keep it real, keep it in check. And kids will always tell it like it is no matter what. So got this diagnosis. We waited about two weeks to tell the kids. They were three, six, and nine at the time. So we told my oldest first. And we said, you know, mom's sick. I'm going to have to have surgery where I can't use my arms. I can't lift anything. You know, if we're going to keep everything as normal as possible. And my oldest is like, okay, so I got to do the dishes more. I can help out mom. I'll help out. I'll go to school. I'll do that. Okay, thank you. Okay, next, my six-year-old, the feisty one. We tell her the diagnosis, and then she's like, do I still have to go to school? Yes, this is more about mom. Dad's going to, you know, we'll have help. We'll take you to school. And I can see her thinking, you know, like, wheels are turning. She's like, can I still use the iPad? I was like, oh, my gosh. Leave it to a kid to realize, okay, this is what's important in their life. I get it. And the youngest, I had to just tell her that I couldn't lift her up. So she was three. I was like, there's going to be a point where I can't carry you. She goes, okay, well, can I at least sit on your lap? Absolutely. So she would fall asleep on my lap because she knew that I couldn't hug, wrap my arms around her. But that whole, like, right from the nine, the six, the three-year-old, I was thinking, like, you know what? They don't see cancer the way adults do. They're looking at their world How it impacts their world, yes, of course. But they have seen me go through cancer as a hurdle. 
something that I overcame. Whereas I saw my grandparents like in the hospital bed, right? After chemotherapy, unable to speak. And so I was kind of like, wow, like our children can grow up in a world where cancer is the hurdle. It is not death. And that to me was like, holy cow, that's unreal. That's modern technology and science at its best. But it's also the lesson that was for me, like, slow it down, pump your brakes, Diane. And that's where I really learned how to say no. I want to do everything, right? Public health teaches us we are saving the world by what we do. And it taught me, you got to say no sometimes. You have to be able to know your boundaries, And I can say no to things. Whereas before, I was saying, yes, yes, I'll make the cookies for school. Yes, I will be the parent chaperone. Yes, I'll do the board meeting. Yes, I will do the other department's work for them. And that's what it taught me. So during that time period, when was it that you felt the most either love or compassion for yourself? In that hospital bed, I'll tell you, it was in that hospital bed when the CNA came by. This is post-surgery, super painful. It was a chore just to like sit up. The CNA came in and asked me if I wanted to wash my hair. I was like, I can't get to the shower. She's like, no, no. So it was like a bedside hair wash. I remember that moment where I was like, oh my gosh, I just have to let go. Like, never mind the way I look. Never mind that there's people coming in and out of my room. Maybe there were visitors. See, I mean, I didn't have my contacts on, so maybe that was good because I couldn't see them. But having that CNA, her name was Ina. She just so oh crap here comes. She was just so loving. And now, mind you, CNAs in the hospital and in caregiving situations are probably the lowest paid, maybe the least technical expertise. But the way she made me feel just by washing my hair, was so caring and loving that I was like, I gotta remember this because this is what I want to impart on other people in my job in healthcare. And that was like, I mean, she barely spoke English. She's like, I wash hair? I'm like, yeah. And I sat there and I couldn't do anything. Tears are streaming down my face, just like now. But she's like, it's okay. I love your hair. I'm going to do this. You'll feel better. And I felt so good. That was like the most refreshing hair wash ever in the hospital bed. And I just remember thinking, this is how I want to make other people feel in healthcare. Loved, cared for, that I am their only focus at this moment in time. And that meant so much to me. The medical staff, the doctors, everyone was just phenomenal. But Ina, the CNA on Powahi 7 was like unbelievable. And that one hair wash, I think it was on day three. I don't know, like I wash my hair every day because it's Hawaii. And when you don't wash your hair, it's nasty. (laughs) It's greasy. She just made me feel like a queen at that moment. And that was like, okay, I'm on the comeback trail. I have to get better because this is how I want others to feel in their darkest despair days. If you could impart a message to your younger self in that moment as you now, what would you say? I'd be like, just wait, because just look to see what kind of joy you're going to bring in the future. I wouldn't give it away to my former self i just be like oh just wait you're, you're gonna be awesome and then if you switch the role then with you being in that spot what is it that you needed to hear from you now that would have helped you get through it feel more loved feel more compassion and move through your lesson i needed to hear that i was enough because i think leading up to that moment you always feel like you're never enough there's something always like an arm's length away that you never can attain. And I just had to realize like, crap, like I have it. I got everything I need. Do you feel that now? Yeah, I do. Surprisingly. I mean, compared back then to now, I feel a much better sense of calm. Remember that book, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff? And we would just page through it. I'm like, really, in the scheme of life, 
like somebody cutting you off on the freeway that's really petty that's really small you gotta refocus to those bigger things like family friends sharing meals i will say post surgery and post cancer it was much easier for me to tell people how i felt and tell people thank you for believing in me even like i wrote letters to like old teachers people who had meaningful impact in my life that probably I would have never had the opportunity to say it to them. I said it to them. So who in your life, including yourself right now, could use a message of appreciation that you wish you could say it to them, but you haven't been able to do it yet? It'll probably be my husband. Jace, thank you so much. I love you for all that you've given to me. And been able to help me through. I hope I don't take you for granted. And thanks for so much love and aloha for me and the kids. And I know I don't say it enough, but I love you with all of my heart. Thank you. As we're kind of landing now, is there anything that we missed or that you'd like to mention or like to cover? I did want to share about, and I have shared this in other spaces, that part about ceremony. So with ceremony, it was in that same time period, like 2017, 2018, that we did a Merry Monarch piece about Haumea. And Haumea is the deity of the goddess of all things, Wahine. And as a daughter, as a wife, as a mother, women fill all these roles and I just remember we learned all these aspects of Haumea and her transformation and the ways that she can almost like, I don't know if I would call it shape-shifting because then people start thinking like Marvel and all, all that stuff. But like shape-shifting in the way of finding female and wahine things in life. And I just remember one of the things that we learned was that Haumea brought order from chaos right so Haumea would be able to take a chaotic situation and just break it down into pieces right and we talked about that like in work right you just break down the project into manageable compartmentalized goals and I was like that is the woman's superpower right it allows us to multitask because we have to take a chaotic home like, okay you do the dishes. You can do the laundry. I'm going to do the yard. You're going to, right? And at work, in the same way, we kind of do the same thing, right? Like, okay, marketing has their role. Ops has their role. IT, finance, and accounting. And I was like, that's a cool superpower to have, right? We bring order out of a chaotic em environment. And I think back to my mom. She did that for our household. My grandma, oh, she could bring order from chaos with just a stare, right? And to me, women have that ability, but also that kuleana, right? Like, yes, it's a burden, kuleana, but it's a kuleana responsibility and a kuleana privilege. Those meanings, burden, responsibility, and privilege are all embodied in the word kuleana. So I'm like, wow, I guess we kind of do bring order from chaos and then my husband jokes and he's like oh yeah like it's like happy wife happy life i'm like yeah because we are the ones that bring order and so i embrace that thought wherever i go and right being a female native hawaiian downtown for a major company where I think people could expect other people to be in this role too. I think it's a little bit more of a, not an edge, but it's something that I think I can use to help in the Western world as well as in the Hawaiian world. And right, like I talk about those two worlds always seem to be on opposite sides, but actually like, no, they're all here. We just have to navigate through both of them. Right? Whether it's, do I be the executive? And I've asked myself this question. 
Do I be the CEO executive or do I be, I just got the whole pa status for Kapahulo Kalelehua. Do I be the whole pa, right? And I'm like, well, I don't know. I'm both, right? Why do I have to be one in one environment and another in another? Because they both intertwine, right? The skill sets that I use as a CEO, I'm a leader in my halal, so I got to use some of those skill sets. The ceremony, the ritual, the pilina that I always do in hula, which is a no-brainer, I got to use it in my work life. And to me, that's the beauty of why it's so awesome to live in Hawaii, because we have these dualities existing in the same place or whether it be other cultures too right i'm yonsei um, i know my japanese heritage I, I think that's why japanese love hula so much because they are so alike in terms of philosophy and humility and pilina and working together that's why it, it's such a no-brainer for japanese to learn hula and hawaiian language so yeah i think that's maybe one of the, the little pearls that I carry with me in terms of, yeah, I can be a Native Hawaiian female business person working downtown Honolulu. I may not have a reverse print Aloha shirt, but I got Aloha Dyer and I got right my ancestors to back me and why not? And people have said, well, okay, you, now you're the role model. I'm like, oh man, what? Like, I don't know. Maybe they don't want to you know, following my footsteps. But then I'm also like, well, I would love to have somebody following my footsteps because that means I'm giving somebody else an opportunity. We joke like, okay, we go, we want to retire, right? So like, yeah, succession planning is real. It's constant. Just like in a halal, right? You have various kumuhula and you have, the reason why we do uniki is to elevate the halal and also to also provide succession so that you know that the school will go on. Same like an organization. You have to have a succession plan because at some part when I finish giving my knowledge and insight to the organization, it'll be somebody else's turn. And that's not scary for me at all. I welcome it and embrace it because that means I did my job in bringing up somebody else and people who are ready to take in my role so that they can elevate the organization. As we're closing this down, I want to send you appreciation for letting me share in your history, who you are, the vulnerable moments, and to get at least a glimpse into what makes you, you. It makes sense to me. That saying where you are the dreams that your ancestors had and the challenge of going through things like cancer that can help you to see that you're more than a human doing, you're mm -hmm. a human being and you can be everything that you are. So thank you for coming on and sharing wow. this with us and I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. If you resonate with Greater Good Radio, please join our community at www.greatergoodradio.com, where you can get access to exclusive content and offerings. Hope to see you soon.